Hi, I'm Dr. MJ Roland Varman. I'm the founder of the SmileWorks Hub, an aesthetic medicine training academy in Liverpool. Today, I'm talking to you about how to reduce the risks of non-surgical rhinoplasty. And we're going to do that with ultrasound. First, we'll look at the anatomical implications of the procedure and how recent advances in handheld ultrasound can help keep your patients safe and dramatically reduce the incidence of complications. Let me make one thing clear. I've only recently been using ultrasound and I am far from an expert. But this technology is new to aesthetic medicine, so I'm here to share my experience. My goal is always the same, to encourage practitioners to treat more safely. I do this because I want our industry to be better and our patients to be safe. Non-surgical rhinoplasty is an extremely popular procedure. It's been breaking out in Google search since 2015 and aesthetic medicine practitioners up and down the country are indulging themselves on this new lucrative revenue stream. Now take a look at the BAP survey into cosmetic surgery treatments. This is surgical rhinoplasty statistics over the same time period. Especially interesting is the decline since 2015. I'll invite you to make up your own mind about the statistics, but I believe a significant proportion of patients, about 30%, are choosing non-surgical procedures over surgery. I believe this is because of a number of factors, the foremost being safety. Put another way, Patients are placing their trust in our industry and turning away from surgical procedures that they perceive as risky, expensive and invasive. So I want you to ask yourselves, how are you meeting this new patient demand? With responsibility, care and respect? Or are you just winging it? Because I think many practitioners are just winging it. I also think that as far as noses are concerned, the aesthetic medicine industry is skating on very thin ice. Sure, non-surgical nose jobs are exploding, but if we continue to cause complications and treat patients without taking suitable safety precautions, then it's all over and these patients will disappear overnight. So on that happy thought, let's have a look at the anatomy of the nose. You will think it looks like this, a lovely paired set of dorsal nasal arteries that come down either side of the midline as terminal branches of the ophthalmic artery. You'll also have been taught that in cross section, the nose looks like this. The dorsal nasal arteries lie in the subcutaneous fat layer beneath the skin and above the nasal smas. We've all been told if we inject along the midline and periosteally or perichondrially, then we will be safe. But if you've ever dissected a cadaver, you'll know structures are often not where you expect them to be. In their 2016 study, Tanzatit and his colleagues found that 28% of individuals have single or large dorsal nasal arteries like this picture. The insides of people are not like the textbooks will have you believe. So what are we worried about? In the 2019 review of blindness resulting from dermal filler treatment, Belesny and colleagues found that 56.3% of all cases reported in the world literature were as a result of treatment to the nose. I had a similar look at the literature and found that 55% of cases of ischemia resulted from treatment of the nose. So, vascular occlusions that affect the skin or cause blindness are overwhelmingly caused by non-surgical rhinoplasty. So the problem is, even though we have read all the books, seen all the pictures, treated hundreds of patients and even chopped up cadavers, there is still a significant risk. Variations in anatomy and the inability to see beneath the surface of the skin is causing serious problems the world over, even in experienced hands. The solution to this problem is ultrasound. I use a Clarius L20 for my treatments. 
It has good resolution, didn't cost the earth, and is easy to use. I'm going to show you just how easy in a minute. Before we look at the nose on the ultrasound, it's important to get the orientation right. The transducer is the little pad that makes the picture. It has a marker on one side of the transducer. There is also a middle marker. This is so we know which side is which on the picture. The end with the marker will come up on the left of the picture and the middle arrow is right in the center of the screen. So with the transducer in line with the nose, the whole thing looks like this. Here you can see the cross section of the nose down the midline and the scanning depth. If we turn it the other way around, so horizontally across the nose, it looks like this. Although I don't use this view often unless checking for vessels, as the resolution on a handheld ultrasound has its limitations. So I'm going to show you images in the first orientation today in line with the nose. So what can we see? Ultrasound is all about recognizing patterns and the different densities of tissues reflect the sound waves differently. So from that, we get a picture of the structures beneath. Here, we can see many of the layers we would expect in the nose. The 2021 findings by Albertshofer and colleagues in their study, The Layered Anatomy of the Nose, an ultrasound-based investigation, will reassure you that you can't always discern all the layers, especially not in the radix and tip. This lack of layer definition may also be the reason why injectors end up in the wrong tissue plane with their cannulas and this is why ultrasound guidance is invaluable. I use brightness mode showing tissue layers and Doppler mode that allows us to see blood vessels. The difference is that on Doppler mode, you can see moving fluid, which is represented by the multicolored bits, which are blood vessels. In this case, it's the dorsal nasal artery. This scan is on the midline, by the way. Doppler mode is what I use to guide filler placement. So let's take this nose for example. Here I'm in the midline of the nose. You can see the depth from the skin to the periosteum is about 0.6 centimeters or six millimeters. You can measure this by using the scale on the side. Often this tissue thickness can even be a couple of millimeters less. I have placed a marker down in surgical pen and I aim the transducer midpoint on this indicator. When performing non-surgical rhinoplasty with needles, I use a BD microfine, which is backfilled. I know the bevel length on that needle is 0.6 millimeters and the needle length is eight millimeters. Here, I could inject the radix with a needle periosteally and I know I'm far enough away from the vessel. I can elect to inject onto periosteum here with confidence knowing there's no vessel periosteally. Okay, now let's compare it to this one. Huge dorsal nasal artery right in the midline. And it also appears to be in the wrong layer under the SMAS. There's probably just over one millimeter between vessel and periosteum. Coming back to the Albertshofer study I mentioned earlier, they also found that there's an 8.3% chance that the nasal arteries are not found in the superficial layer in the radix. Do you want to chance this without knowing where your needle is going? Oh yeah, and by the way, this patient is me. I'm going to come right out and say it. As an educated and risk-averse injector, I would never, ever let anyone inject me in the nose without first mapping the vessels with ultrasound. So why are we putting our patients in this predicament? What about this chap? He's had a couple of previous surgical procedures. This means that his blood vessels are going to be all over the place and the layers of the nose might be stuck down with fibrous scar tissue. What's more, his issue isn't so much on the midline, so he wants his treatment to smooth the lateral parts of the nose as well. This case has danger written all over it. 
So in cases like this, I use ultrasound guided injection. Sitting there, you probably think this is difficult, but it is really not. I mean, I've been doing this for months, not years, so you can absolutely do this too. I pick my entry point, so in this case, I'm going to go through the tip with my 25 gauge cannula. It's great that I can use a 25 gauge here. Normally, I would have been much too chicken to use this width in the nose because I know they can still end up in blood vessels. But guided, I can see exactly where it is. I put it in position and this time I have my transducer covered with a tegaderm dressing to prevent contamination. I'm also using sterile ultrasound gel. Here's a shot of the arrangement I use. This is a different patient, but the method's the same. I can guide my cannula exactly to where I want it. You can see it there. It's the long straight thing. When I'm satisfied the position is good, I inject. You can see here, I'm actually quite close to the vessels, but I am placing with confidence of knowing that I'm not going to cause an occlusion because I can see the tip of my cannula. Here's another clip from the same procedure. My filler is placed in exactly the right place. I've not damaged any vessels. Patient is delighted. My blood pressure is within the normal range. Everybody wins. So as you can see, I've informed my choice of technique by the patient's individual anatomy. We're no longer winging it or guessing but changing our approach in an evidence-based fashion to dramatically improve safety. After placement, we can check the filler is where we want it to be. Here you can see the oval filler deposit periosteally. Filler on ultrasound is dark or hypoechoic, so it doesn't reflect any sound back. Any collections of fluid are black on an ultrasound. That's why blood vessels on B mode also come up black. You can see it's lying under a vessel here. And here's another example of one I treated about 18 months back. Over time, filler loses its definition and becomes a little less hypoechoic and less defined as it breaks down in the tissues. So you're probably thinking, I'm doing loads of noses, I can do them in five minutes and I've never had an occlusion. Why should I add extra time to my treatment and spend money on a handheld ultrasound machine and all the training to use it? Well, I thought this too. I always had a feeling in the pit of my stomach when doing nose filler treatments and I've probably done thousands of them. I got away with the ones that I did. But as I got more busy and experienced, I started getting referrals for complications to manage. And lots of the vascular occlusions are noses. Here's three from the last year alone. I have been very, very lucky to never cause an occlusion of the nose. But from those I have managed, I can tell you they are traumatic terrifying, excruciating anguish that sometimes but thankfully rarely, ends in permanent disfigurement. Like this lady. This one had been caused by a doctor. I'm not saying that to antagonize you. Just be aware that everyone, even the most experienced injectors, can have complications. I want to be able to look my patients in the eye and tell them that I did everything in my power to reduce their risk of harm. And in my capacity as a medical professional, if I know ultrasound is available and I didn't use it, unfortunately, I can't tell them I did everything I could. If logic rather than ethics are more your thing, let's look at it this way. In a civil claim, loss of vision in one eye is worth between 46 and 51,000 pounds. Facial scarring is around 35,000 pounds in a young female. That's not very much, but if you add this to the special damages, trauma, loss of earnings, and ancillary costs, you might be looking at a total reward of double that. Let it get a bit messy and you can add about £100,000 in legal costs and a dramatic increase in your insurance premiums, emotional trauma, stress, and lost opportunities. Or 
You can invest in an ultrasound, do your training, build your practice with it, and sleep better at night. So join me in the future of aesthetic medicine, a safer future with ultrasound. And on that note, thank you and have a good day.